Right then, in this episode, none of this road bike nonsense. <laughs> Let's build a Chinese carbon gravel bike. Now, it's not going to be your average build. I've got some components I've never, never seen, let alone fitted to a bike before. And at the end, I'll let you know if I was to do it all again, what parts I would change. So yeah, it's going to be a wicked episode. So stick around. Right then, Sirocco dropping back in to sponsor another episode. And summer is right around the corner, ladies and gents, and Sirocco have me kitted out, so they bought out some great new stuff, like these SRX Pro jerseys. I showed this off the last time, but this thing is absolutely pucker. It's super comfortable, especially when the sun is kind of baking down on you. The fabric helps wick away the sweat nice and quickly, keeping you nice and cool. Plus the overall quality of the fabrics is top notch. I've tried to take some good pictures, so hopefully this is coming across. The construction of the jersey is really well thought out as well. So it's a lightweight fabric, but they put some reinforcements on the back for the, for the pockets so you can still carry around all your stuff and, and you don't have to worry. And these bib shorts are incredible as, as well. So they come in some great colors. You've got a few different choices. The padding is amazing. And again, the quality of the fabrics and the overall construction, like, like the stitching, is really, really nice. But if you wanted something a little more budget friendly, their M2 jerseys are great. So this is a really nice one. I actually, I always get compliments when I've got this on and I was wearing it out and about today. And you can pick this one up for like 37 quid. Or this one here, another favorite of mine. I've had this for 18 months. I'm, I must have worn this nearly a hundred times, but it still looks basically brand new. So yeah, I love the Sirocco gear. It's great value and looks amazing. So if you wanted to get yourself kitted out, for some summer cycling, then yeah, use my link in the video description down below and save 10% off the entire Sirocco site, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, enough of this, and let's build a gravel bike. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another What is Love? Trace Fellow production. My name, as always, is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's Luke. Right, so let's not muck around and get straight down to business. Loads of you have been asking, so we're doing a gravel bike build today. Here's the itinerary. We'll start off with the parts run now, show you kind of what I've chosen and why, then we'll get into the build, followed by first impressions, final cost and weight. And then, um, yeah, I'll compare the bike that I've built before your very eyes to some off the shelf options from some name brand manufacturers. Uh, and, then, and then at the very end, I'll tell you, if I was to do it all again, what parts would I change? Because there are a couple, actually. Um, because you don't know this, but I've actually, in this timeline, I've already built the bike. The bike's actually out there, in the hallway. It's done. I'm filming this after I built it. Movie magic, what can I say? Um, anyway, <laughs> without further ado, yeah, let's crack on. I'll see you in the build. Hwa! Okay, so this is the frame, and it's from a pretty big player, actually, in the Chinese carbon game. It's a company called ICAN that made this frame, so ICAN Cycling. This is their X gravel frame, and I've got it in this delicious uh, turquoise color. I'm not sure if it's, it's kind of coming across on camera, but the color is really, really lovely in person. So, um, yeah, you get the frame, you get the forks, carbon seat post. You also get the, uh, the standard kind of finishing kit and the derailleur hangers, and you also get the through axles on the back and the front as well, which is cool. Now, the overall quality of the frame, at least from kind of an initial impression, yeah, it looks, looks really good, basically. So the, the quality of the paint job is really nice, so there's no kind of flaky paint, no bubbling, no kind of missed spots or anything like that. And there are also mounting points all over the frame, so they're, yeah, these bolts are peppered all over the frame, basically. So you could have uh, got loads of mounting points for kind of uh, bottle cages, panniers, mud guards and the like. So basically this looks like it could be a really capable kind of adventure bike. So that might well be a kind of route I take with this frame. And importantly, the kind of fitted aluminium inserts that are molded into the frame, they're really well placed as well and everything's nice and flush. So you've got the bottom bracket cups in here. Yeah, the threading looks really nice in there. And these aluminium insets here where you mount the rear brake, they look great. So yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I've got high hopes basically for this frame. It looks like it'll go together well and the quality, the overall quality of the finishing, really top notch. 
Okay, so I'm actually gonna be running a one by drivetrain on this bike, but there is a removable front derailleur hanger there. So you could easily run a two bar drivetrain if that's uh, kind of what you were into. Now tire clearance with this frame, you can fit 700 by 45 C tires on as kind of a max, max width. So they'll take some really chunky tires on this frame as well. And I also took the liberty of looking inside the frame tubes with an endoscope to see if I could spot any kind of rough and ready molding defects on the inside of the frame. So check this out. Okay, so, for, so forgive the quality of the, of the camera work here, but it was pretty interesting looking inside the frame actually. So we're going down the seat tube here and you can see it's pretty, uh, pretty clean. The silver inserts are the riv nuts or rivet nuts for the bottle cages. And the two below, these are for the front derailleur hanger. So carrying on down, you can see the yellow cable guide tube for the, for the rear derailleur. And below that, the aluminium bottom bracket insert. Again, the threading, threading looks nice here. The molding around it looks good and the edges are nice and clean. So yeah, good job so far from what I can see. Now looking into the down tube. So again, it's a, <laughs> it's a bit shaky. It's kind of difficult to get the camera where you need it, but you can see the uh, yellow cable guide tubes and the pretty clean finish of the carbon on the interior. Got the riv nuts for the bottle cages at the back and now into the uh, top tube. So similar story here, a clean finish on the carbon, no huge voids visible or anything like that. And again, more riv nuts at the top for mounting like a top tube bag or something. Now this is the interior of the head tube. I was interested in this little piece here where the cables feed into the frame. You can see the molding around it is pretty nice and the general carbon layup in here. Yeah, pretty solid as well, nice nice and clean. So all in all, while not a complete x-ray of the frame or anything like that, I'm certainly happy with it. It looks clean, no hidden gremlins from what I can see. But if you lot have spotted anything untoward, definitely let me know in the comments. So all in all, seems like a really well put together kind of carbon gravel frame really. Yeah, seems, seems nicely made. But full disclosure, I haven't actually bought this frame I can send me this uh, for free for kind of the purposes of the review. But if you wanted to um, pick one of these up yourself, you'd be looking to pay about 560 quid, which considering kind of the, the quality of, of the frame seems like cracking value. Now, just FYI, after recording this, I managed to grab you a lot of 5% discount on the price of the frame. So yeah, you can, uh, you can check that out in the video description later if you want but um, I'll reserve full judgment until the end once it's kind of built and stuff. So with that being said, let's check out some of the other parts. Okay, so I'm sure it will come as a little surprise to many of you that have watched my stuff. The group set that I've chosen for this build comes from Sensar and I have gone for their um, Sensar, their SRX Pro group set. So it's a gravel specific one by group set. Um, it's, it's 11 speed and yeah, it's fully mechanical. So both the, uh, both the braking and the gear shifting is uh, cable actuated there. Now, once again, I haven't actually paid for this since I sent me this for free to review, but you can pick these up for like a hundred pounds on AliExpress. They are literally some of the cheapest group sets out there and they're seemingly well reviewed as well. Um, now, just to, just to kind of keep you in the loop, the, the, the lever arm here that was made of plastic, there was that whole saga where it broke on me. They're the updated aluminium variety, so durability should be spot on. And the rear derailleur here can take a cassette ranging from 11 to 52 tooth. So a really good range on the rear cassette as well. So yeah, high hopes for that. Okay, so for the cassette to pair with this, I went for this thing. So it's completely blinktastic. A bright blue cassette from ZTTO. So this thing is an 11 to 46 tooth cassette. All the teeth are made of steel, so it should be nice and durable. But the party piece for this is that it's completely hollow. So much like the SRAM red cassettes or the S Road cassette that I'm currently using on my road bike, yeah, this uh, this thing is is milled out from a single billet of steel. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So save a little bit of weight. Now cost-wise, this thing was 75 quid on AliExpress, so pretty reasonable actually. Um, so cheaper than the Shimano Dior cassette of the same kind of range. And um, yeah, it comes in lighter too. So this thing is 60 grams lighter than the equivalent Shimano Dior cassette. So yeah, this thing's pretty cool. 
Okay, so the crank for this build comes from a company called Senix. So these guys are actually a sister company to Sensar. So you'll often find on AliExpress the Sensar group sets being kind of bundled in with cranks from Senix. And I've been using this very crank on the box, actually, this PR2 crank from, from Senix on my road bike for the last few hundred miles. And it has been completely flawless. So high hopes for this one. So it's not the PR2 in here. It's actually their gravel specific crank in here. It's the Senix GR2, which hopefully you can see there. So I've gone for a 44 tooth um, chain ring. So it's quite large actually for a gravel bike, but it should mean I get some, I get some decent speed on the flats. It's a full aluminium construction. So chain rings and the arms are made of aluminium and the axle as well, actually. And the profile of the teeth looks nice and chunky as well. So I've got high hopes that this should be pretty durable. Now, uh, once again, I got this sent to me for free um so bear that in mind but yeah this crank looks really tasty and finally ladies and gentlemen the chain shram pc triple one zero great budget option this one 11 quid i paid for this thing on on ebay winner winner chicken dinner easy peasy anyway that's <laughs> that's the drivetrain let's check out some other bits Right then, this handlebar is a pretty cool. So um, yeah, it's a flared carbon jobby from AliExpress, 40 centimeters along the top, um, and seems really well made actually. 36 quid I pay for this thing, and yeah, I think this is gonna be a, a good option. It's not internally rooted, because I couldn't be bothered to internally root the cables in this one, so I'm just running them under the bar tape like a pleb. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll be pairing, pairing this quite tasty looking bar with this. So it's a giant, contact stem and i picked this up for 28 quid now name brand parts on a trace fellow build what, what is what is happening right now and that's a great question but all will become clear very shortly right then bar tape for these bars this stuff six quid from aliexpress looks pretty good but importantly it matches the color of my bike. Woo! Uh, yeah, I've, I've absolutely no idea what this stuff is like. Could be trash, but we will find out for six quid. Difficult to turn down. Now, pedals. I probably should get some Shimano SPD pedals, something like really cool gravel specific, but I haven't. So I'm just gonna raid my uh, spare parts bin. I'll probably end up using the Costello pedals actually that I reviewed in a previous episode. They're a kind of Time Espresso 12 <laughs> knockoff. Great episode, by the way. So go and check that out if you haven't already, but I'll probably stick them on the bike and give them some abuse. Um, now, as for the saddle, something uh, pretty pretty standard It's this. So it's a, a specialized power saddle. Again, I just kind of had it hanging around in a spare parts bin. It's actually a fantastic saddle. Got a nice bit of squish to it, so it's um, nice and comfortable. And it's about 60 to 80 quid for one of these. So there we go. Anyway, let's get on to some more tasty bits. Okay, the wheels for the build. I went for a bit of a budget option this time, actually. So these are from Fulcrum. They're racing six wheels, which hopefully you can see there. So yeah, um, they're a full aluminum construction. No, <laughs> no carbon fiber here. Um, and yeah, they should be tubeless as well. So they use Fulcrum's two-way fit system. So allegedly, these are tubeless compatible. So I've stuck on some tubeless rim tape and also stuck in a, a tubeless valve there as well. So we shall see. Now, weight-wise, they're not the lightest things in the world. 1.75 kilos for both of these but yeah they are they are good value so i picked up these second hand for 150 quid so you can find quite a lot of these on the second hand market or you can get them new for about 200 quid so yeah they're a solid wheel set got pretty decent reviews so yeah should be good now if you're running tubeless like me add an extra 30 to 40 quid on top for your rim tape your valves and also the sealant which is in there <laughs> somewhere um anyway yeah those are the wheels and very quickly, tyres for these uh, these wheels. I've gone for Schwalbe or Schwalbe G1 all-round tyres. So these are a really well-respected tubeless gravel tyre. These are in 700 by 40C and cost me 55 quid for both. So yeah, got these for a really good deal as well. Okay, so the braking setup for this frame is disc brake, front and the uh, front and back, and the hubs there on those wheels are center lock. So I could use these pretty tasty looking Shimano uh, Ice Tech rotors. Uh, so these are a pretty fancy aluminium and steel sandwich designed to kind of dissipate the heat under braking. 
but they are pretty, pretty pricey. So it's a hundred quid for the, for the set of these, 50 quid each basically. So why use tried and trusted technology when I could instead use these, which cost me more than 10 times less. <laughs> it was nine quid for both of these disc brake rotors from AliExpress. Now I've already used both disc brake uh, rotors here for a couple thousand miles already on my disc brake road bike and these have been <laughs> great to be honest with you so you're happy to get them on the gravel bike and I'll be pairing them up with these so these are some center lock to six bolt disc adapters to fit the, the hubs on those wheels um, yeah these are about three or four quid each from AliExpress and I've used a very similar set for thousands and thousands of miles on my disc brake road bike with no issues so these should be fine. Now the actual braking system for these discs. In the past, I've used a fully mechanical disc brake setup. I've used a hybrid hydraulic disc brake setup using these, uh, these calipers here. And for the last few months, I've been uh, running a fully hydraulic disc brake setup on my, on my road bike, it's what I'm using currently. But the, the setup for, the, for this gravel bike is different to all of those. So here it is, it is the, the giant conduct hydraulic disc brake system. Now, some of you have probably already guessed this is what I was gonna use, but here it is. So yeah, you've got the uh, the brake calipers here, and these are nothing particularly special, but this is where kind of the, the magic happens here. Let me grab it for you. So this thing sits on the front of the stem, kind of in place of the, of the face plate, and this contains the reservoir and the hydraulic pistons, which power those calipers there. Now, the uh, the spacing of the bolts on the front of a stem faceplate, there's no industry standard for that. Hence the reason I actually had to choose this uh, this giant stem here because the spacing of those four bolts is, is slightly different on basically every stem. So yeah, I had to match a giant stem with this giant conduct system here. So the regular mechanical group set, in this case, the uh, sensor group set in there, the cables from the brakes feed into each side of this kind of reservoir piston <laughs> faceplate here. And then when you uh, pull the brakes, it compresses a piston and shoots hydraulic fluid out of the back, actually, out of these two ports on the back here, down into the, uh, the calipers, and then that's what stops you. So it's a really unique braking setup. It's actually been discontinued by Giant. I don't think it was <laughs> particularly, particularly popular, but this is new old stock, so it's never been used. And I picked this up for 150 quid on eBay. So it's not particularly cheap, but I've always wanted to give it a go and compare it to kind of all the other brake setups that I've tried. Now from doing a bit of research, I've heard it's very difficult and frustrating to bleed this Giant Conduct braking system. And it's one of the reasons it wasn't particularly popular, but luckily I found this. So it's a, yeah, a bleed kit specifically designed to uh, bleed the, the giant conduct system. You need some special connectors and stuff. Um, and this was only like 15 quid on eBay. So this should really help out. But yeah, really interested to get this installed. But all in all, I've got some really interesting and unique parts for this build actually. So yeah, really interested to get it all stuck on the bike. So let's get cracking. Also, while I've got you, if you could, yeah, if you could please subscribe and maybe hit the like button as well, it really, really helps out. I'm, I'm a one-man show around here, so putting this whole episode together took me a couple of weeks overall, really. Um, so yeah, thank you in advance, and let's crack on. Right, so first things first, got to get the wheels set up. So mounting the tubeless tires was pretty straightforward, but the fulcrum wheels weren't the easiest to work with, actually. The bead of the tire didn't stay seated on the rim particularly well, and I ended up um, spilling <laughs> a bit of sealant, which you can see here on, on the carpet. But after setting them up, I did face another issue, actually. So I stuck a little video up on Instagram and YouTube, and here it is. Okay, so I've got a question for you lot out there, actually. So I'm in the middle of doing the gravel bike build, which some of you may be aware of, and I'm running tubeless tires. Now, when I do builds with tubeless stuff, I tend to set them up overnight just to make sure they hold pressure. So I've got a set of tires here. They're Schwalbe G1 all round tires, um, and they've got the TLE moniker there to suggest that they're tubeless compatible. So I set up this tire here, filled it with sealant, span it round, and then sprayed some soapy water around the outside to make sure I didn't have any uh, holes and, and leaks. But there's loads of leaks from the side wall of the tire. So it's not bubbling from the rim and the rim is, well, the, the tire is properly seated on the rim. But yeah, it's, it's bubbling directly out of the side wall, which is really weird. Never faced anything like this before with any tires that I've used. 
So let me know, is this kind of a known issue with these with these tires? So thank you to everyone that commented, super helpful. And turns out the sidewalls of these tires are generally just a bit porous. So it just takes time for the sealant to soak in and kind of take effect. So after a day or two and a little sealant top up, no more leaking and they hold pressure just fine. So yeah, good to go. Right, next up, I had to get the disc rotors mounted up. So the discs I've chosen are six bolt and the hubs on these wheels are center lock. So you uh, you can see I've got to use that little adapter. So stuck that on and tightened it up with a bottom bracket wrench, actually. Um, you can also hear when I tap the disc. Yeah, it, it rings nicely, so no rattling. So yeah, these should be nice and solid, basically. Um, right, next up, let's get the cassette mounted. Okay, cool, so I'm about to stick this uh, bright blue cassette onto the free hub here, but whenever you're doing this, do yourself a little favor and stick a little bit of just, this is multi-purpose grease, put a bit of grease on the free hub. It's gonna make removal of this in the future much easier. So when fitting a cassette, don't be afraid to give the lock ring some welly with your cassette wrench or whatever. Now, most specify 40 Newton meters of torque on the lock ring, which is, which is quite a lot, actually. Now, it might seem unnecessary given the splines on the free hub, which kind of grab the cassette, but given, uh, giving the lock ring some decent torque can massively reduce cassette bite and make your free hub last much longer, basically. Okay, cool, so wheels and tires are set up, good to go. Next up, I'm actually gonna use this finishing kit that came with the bike, including these headset bearings here, and put them into the frame so they go at the front here. So this smaller bearing here, this red one, goes bevel down in the top there. So I'll put a bit of grease inside here um, and coat the bearing as well, pop that in, and that'll be good to go. And the same with this bearing here, so it actually goes the other way, so bevel up this time. I'll put a bit of grease around it, and inside the kind of cup in here, and pop that in like so. But before I do that, I did want to have a quick chat about this um, crown crown raise here because I've had a few questions about this in the past. Okay, I've covered this before, so I'll try and be quick, but in the majority of finishing kits with frames like this, you normally have something like this, which is a separate crown race. So you can see it's normally got a split in it like so, and it's beveled like that. So what that's meant to do is match the bevel underneath the uh, main headset bearing. You can see there's that 45 degree bevel there. And then it goes on top of that and that gives it something to kind of, kind of spin upon, basically. So this is necessary for forks like this, because you can see there, it's a 90 degree angle at the bottom right here. So you put the uh, crown race on like so, and then it gives it that nice bevel, which the uh, main headset bearing can kind of sit on top of, like so, to give it something to rotate on. Now I omit this uh, separate crown race on forks like this. So you can see here, that fork already has that 45 degree angle in it. So when you put the bearing on, it, it helps to preload the bearing and it's already molded into the fork. Now I've got a lot of stick in the past for not including the uh, separate crown race on forks like this, but I've used them for thousands and thousands of miles without a separate crown race and they've been fine. But in the case of forks like this, the use of the crown race is mandatory. Right, time to get stuck in. So I went straight for the headset and fitting the fork, which is how I usually start these builds. But pretty soon I realized it was gonna be much easier to get the hydraulic brake line for the rear caliper fed through the frame first. <laughs> now I remember a guy called Marco actually mentioned this in a comment on a previous video and he was totally right. Much easier to get this done first while the frame is, is naked. After that, I got the headset bearings seated, including that crown race, fitted a few spaces and loosely fitted the stem. Now it's worth pointing out here, I usually go for a hundred millimeter stem length on my, on my road bikes. But in this case, as it's a gravel bike, the riding position is slightly more upright and, and nimble. So it's, it's generally accepted you need a shorter stem. So I dropped the length down to 80 millimeters. Might not be applicable for you, depending on what length of stem you ride. But for me, yeah, it was the right choice. Okay, cool. So the headset bearings are in and it all fits nicely. The front, so that's good to go. But whilst the frame was naked, I figured it was the best time actually to run the brake hose for the rear brake caliper. So on the conduct kit, the brake hoses are pre-applied to the calipers, which makes life a little bit easier. So yeah, whilst there was nothing on the frame, I took the opportunity to run the rear brake hose through the chain stay tube, um, up, the, up the down tube here, and popped it out of its correct hole in the frame there. So it sat ready to be plumbed in, which is cool, kind of in its final position. But the next thing I need to decide is how kind of tall uh, I want the steerer tube. So where to cut the steerer tube, basically. Okay, so my road bike up on the wall here is an incredibly comfortable bike, actually. So from the stem cap 
down to the center of the wheel there, down to the axle, that's 65 centimeters, that distance there. So I'm gonna add an extra two centimeters onto that because I want a slightly more relaxed kind of stance on my, on my gravel bike. So from, uh, well, basically with, with three centimeters worth of spaces from the very top here, of the, of the stem, where the stem cap would be, down to the center of the axle there. That is 67 centimeters, so basically spot on. So that's where I'm gonna cut it, because yeah, I want a bit more of a relaxed stance. I have a feeling it's probably gonna be a bit high, but um, yeah, it's a lot easier to cut a steerer tube shorter than to kind of extend it. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna go for. So yeah, let's get this steerer tube cut. Okay, so a uh, quick word of advice for you here, folks. Uh, carbon fiber dust is no joke. It's pretty toxic, actually, it's nasty stuff. So I've got a mask on and I've got the garage door open as well. So if you are going to do this yourself, don't do it in your airing cupboard or your closet. A word of advice for you there. Right, so cutting the steerer tube. I'm just using a hacksaw and it works for me. Other than being careful with the carbon fiber dust, the most important thing here is making sure the cut is level, basically at 90 degrees. If the cut is wonky or at a funny angle like this, it, it compromises the compression plug that fits inside and can make your life difficult. It's, it's not good, basically. So yeah, try and keep the cut clean and even. And after you're done, you can also lightly sand the sharp edges, which can prevent any splintering of the carbon when messing around with the stem and headset setup. You can also see here, after I was done, I sprayed the area down with water to stop the carbon dust getting kicked into the air. So yeah, just take your time here, be careful, and you'll be good to go. Okay, cool, made some great progress. So both wheels are on, got the rear brake in place, and the, the headset is, well, the, the front of the bike is basically good to go. So steerer tube was cut, and this is all nicely preloaded now. So inside there, I've got one of these. It's a compression plug or an expander plug. And I've done a whole video on some lightweight variants of these you can pick up for pretty cheap on AliExpress. So check that out later if you want. Um, yeah, I've also got this quite funky looking stem cap on the top here. So this accepts uh, GoPro mounts on the front. So it helps me get some cool footage. And you can also put a light on there as well. So that's useful. Anyway, next up, I'm gonna be fitting the rear derailleur, the front brake, and I'll also fit the handlebars as well. But while I'm doing that, I'll also fit this. So this is the, um, yeah, the reservoir and piston combo for the, uh, the conduct kit. And this basically replaces that, uh, yeah, that little faceplate there. So I'll pop that on, put the bar on. So yeah, let's get cracking and I'll check back in with you in a minute. Right, getting the front brake fitted is easy peasy. Just thread the brake line through the hole in the fork and then mount the caliper with the supplied bolts. Then the rear derailleur again, super simple. The screw is captive, so just bolts straight into the hanger. Fitting the handlebars was just as easy, really. The conduct kit fits straight onto the stem and you can see here, the majority of my time was actually taken getting the bar centered and in the right position. I also took two seconds at the end here to get a saddle mounted. So yeah, this whole process was just doing up a series of bolts, basically. So yeah, nice and easy. Okay, nice. This thing is really coming together. So I've got the uh, the brakes front and back fitted. It's worth pointing out I'm running a 160 millimeter brake rotor. So I've had to add these adapter plates to the bottom of the calipers to size them up to larger. 160 rotors, so there's the one for the front there. So yeah, they're set up good to go. I've got the rear derailleur fitted there, which you can see, and the bars are on. So you can see I've got that nice gravel flare there on the bar, so the, the shifters are gonna be sat at a nice jaunty angle. So those look really cool. And this weird piston reservoir combo is stuck to the front, so it looks really alien, but it holds the bar nice and steady, so that's all good to go. So next up, I'm gonna get the shifters mounted. So I've got my shifters and cables down there. So I'll just get them uh, put on the bar, basically to where I want them. And then what I'll do is I'll just run the single gear cable for the rear derailleur, because as mentioned, I'm not, I'm not running a front derailleur. It's a one by system. Uh, so yeah, I'll get the, uh, the gear run for the rear derailleur set up, because then I'll need to tackle the brake runs, because I'm just, I'm not entirely sure how they plumb into the back of this conduct system. I've never, seen one of these before or dealt with them. So yeah, that's gonna be a bit of an interesting journey getting these brake lines fitted. But yeah, I'll stick with what I know to start with and get the rear derailleur set up. So yeah, wish me luck and let's crack on. Okay, so this part usually takes uh, takes a bit of time. I'm quite pedantic about mounting my shifters, especially on carbon handlebars, which can be a little less forgiving than their aluminium brethren. I also tend to include a bit of plastic or vinyl packaging behind the shifter clamps on carbon bars, which you can see here. I find it grips the carbon better than bare metal, and the bit of plastic tends to help spread the clamping load a little more evenly too, which, which yeah, which always helps. Now, cabling up the rear derailleur was super simple. The bars aren't internally rooted, which, <laughs> yeah, this really helps. And I've covered this process many times 
programs before. So if you want to see it in a bit more detail, check this video here where I do a full install of a Sensar group set if you're interested. Right, cool. So yes, all coming together now actually. So shifters are mounted in their final positions and clamped onto the bar. It, it looks really weird. I'm so used to drops coming straight down. Having them at this really weird angle means the shifter is tilted right over, but it seems nice and comfortable actually. So really interested to get out on the road and, and give this a go. Now this shifter controls the rear derailleur and it's all cabled in, or at least the, uh, the rear derailleur is cabled in. So it's this particular line feeds into the bike and you will see the rear derailleur, yeah, all cabled up. Now, it probably won't come across on camera, so I'll throw up some pictures, but the cable management on this rear derailleur is really nicely designed, actually. So, yeah, big props to Sensar. That is a um, nicely designed rear derailleur, that one. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, the next job is one I've been putting off, frankly. It is sorting out these brake lines. Okay, cool. So I've, I've loosely cabled in this right-hand shifter to give you an idea of how this functions. But with the conduct kit, you get these. So you get a really short run of brake cable. That's a brake cable. Then you've got the correct end to go into the back of the shifter. And you get a nice short run of brake cable outer as well. So that spans the really short distance between the back of the shifter and the, um, yeah, the inlet for the cable on this uh, reservoir piece here. So yeah, I've, I've cabled in this, uh, this shifter here and you will see comes out the back into the into the conduct kit there and then it pops out the brake cable does right here and there's a little grub screw there so you wind in that grub screw grabs onto the cable and then when you pull the brake cable goes shorter obviously this gets pulled in compresses a piston and then hydraulic uh, fluid is pushed out of the back of these these ports in the reservoir here Okay, so the brake hoses are obviously much too long, uh, so I'll cut them to length. And in terms of plumbing them into the back of this reservoir here via those ports on the back, it seems to be exactly the same as it would be plumbing the hoses into a back of a hydraulic shifter. So a couple of months ago, I did a whole hydraulic install, so I'll cut in some footage of uh, crimping the, the, the hydraulic hoses into the back of the shifter and sealing them up using some olives and some barbs, which you can see here. So the process seems to be exactly the same as that. So I'm a, I won't go into too much detail here and also it's also gonna be really difficult to film, but I'm gonna get these hydraulic hoses fitted into the back and yeah, I'll see you in a little bit. So wish me luck. This is gonna be tricky, I think. Okay, so plumbing in the brake lines was actually very easy. The most difficult part was deciding how long the lines needed to be, but once they were cut to length, as I suspected, the install was pretty much the same as any other hydraulic shifter. In many ways, it was actually easier. With the ports underneath the bar, you have a bit more room to kind of manoeuvre and don't have to contend with oil leaking all over the rubber shifter hoods and stuff like that. As you can see here, I, I got into the groove a little bit and started bleeding the brakes before I realised I needed to film a little update. So yeah, let's jump back in. Okay, so obviously made a good bit of progress and I have plumbed in the front and rear brakes into this kind of reservoir piston combo here. Very, very straightforward. Exactly the same as plumbing lines into the back of a shifter basically. So stick an olive on the end, do up this bolt, it crushes it all up, keeps it nice and tight. So that is good to go. I'm in the process now of bleeding the front brake caliper. So you will definitely need a bike stand because you have to have the bike at this weird angle. Basically, you need to keep the top of the bleed port the highest point in the system and also have it at a 45 degree angle, um, according to the, <laughs> the instructions over there. So yeah, you need a bike stand to help you keep it in that position. Then what you're doing, filling up a syringe, attaching it to the caliper at the bottom there, and then forcing the fluid up through the lines, pushing out all the bubbles, and they're kind of, yeah, coming out the top into the top of this syringe here. Seems to be going well so far. So yeah, I'll get the front done, get the rear done, and then, then I'll check the brakes out basically. Really interested to see how well this performs because cable stretch should be completely negligible. So it should feel nice and precise as long as I've bled it properly. So yeah, wish me luck. I'm gonna crack on, get both sets of brakes bled, and we'll see how we get on. Five minutes later. Right, cool, so the uh, the brakes are set up and good to go, basically, front and rear. And all things considered, this wasn't actually that much more complicated than kind of setting up a regular hydraulic group set, really. Couple of extra steps, but it's all really logical and, and certainly makes sense. Now, what I would say is having a bike stand is an absolute necessity, just because of the slightly odd angles you need to hold the bike in in order to get all the bubbles out of the brake lines. But yeah, check this out. So, got this brake, cable goes in and the top here, and I've terminated there with a, with a nice little end cap. So I'll pull that, 
goes inside, compresses a piston, fires fluid down to the caliper, and yeah, you're good to go. So uh, brakes front and rear seem pretty snappy actually. I think I did a pretty good job bleeding the brakes, but I won't really know until I get it out on the road. With that in mind, last little bit, so I've got the crank, bar tape, and chain, so I'll get them thrown on and the bike will be complete. So I'll check back in with you in a few seconds. Okay, so uh, here it is in its final form, and I think it looks absolutely amazing. Plus, the uh, bar tape job on there looks pretty tasty as well. Um, yeah, now I've got to confess, I have already had a quick go on this thing. Right, right away. Yeah, uh, say no more. Let's do it. This is such good, this is such good fun. Why have I not done this before? This is, yeah, this is a bit of a revelation actually. Yeah, loving this, I've got to say. Okay then, so this thing is pretty damn cool. And yeah, the build went really well as well. So let's get into some details. Okay, so the first thing that I, I want to mention, and it's the backbone of any build really, and it's the frame. So this X gravel frame from ICANN was an absolute dream to work on. From what I've seen so far, easily one of the best frames that I've ever featured on this channel. Now with most of the frames that I've, I've shown you a lot, there's always a little bit of fettling or, or small adjustment needed to the frame to get all the components squared away and where they should be. For example, my rim brake road bike, which happens to be on the wall up there, the seat post kept slipping inside the frame, so I had to come up with a, with a fix for that. And the rear derailleur hanger sat at a funny angle, so I actually had to shim it with a small piece of plastic to ensure the, the gear change at the back was nice and crisp. I mean, even my recent uh, road bike build using the Trifox frame back in October of 2020, I, I needed to chamfer a small hole in the frame using a, a little file to ensure that the cable run for the rear brake fed through the through the frame smoothly. But with this X gravel frame behind me here, nothing like that. The whole frame is spot on, basically. The paint job is, is fantastic. The internal finish on the frame is nice and tidy. The cable routing was, it was a piece, it was a piece of cake. And the molded inserts, like the bottom bracket and the, uh, yeah, the mounting points for the front and rear brakes are, are, are perfect. Now, admittedly, I'm only 80 to 100 miles into the frame at this point, so I obviously can't talk to longevity, but from what I've seen during the build, the overall fit and finish of this frame, yeah, I can have done a bang up job with this thing. Very, very impressive. Now, if you did want to kind of check them out, I've got a link below that'll get you 5% uh, off your off your final order if you, if you did want to want to pick one of these up. But genuinely, yeah, this frame is really, really nice. Now, shifting with the uh, Sensar SRX Pro group set I've got in here, Again, very high praise from me. The shifting is accurate, it's light, it's crisp, all the way up and down the range. I've had no miss shifts and no dropped chains with this thing. The rear derailleur is also nice and robust and, and really well made. Now it doesn't have a clutch mechanism like a lot of the higher end gravel group sets, but it does have an adjustable tension on the derailleur arm. So you can kind of set that to uh, suit the style of riding you're doing. So I have the tension for the derailleur arm set on medium and I've had one instance of chain slap and that's when I hit this massive rut in the road at a really high speed basically. But yeah, overall I am very impressed with this group set. The, sh the shifting is so nice and for the price, basically I just love it when I can give a full recommendation to some of the more budget options that I show you guys and this is definitely one of those instances. So yeah, really good job on this group set sensor. Nice work. And while we're on the topic, this crank from Senex, this GR2 crank, uh, seems great as well. So the chain ring is made of 7075 aluminium alloy, which is, a, which is a great choice for this application. It runs silently up and down the range and the teeth, as well as being nice and chunky, so should be should be pretty durable. Yeah, they use a narrow wide profile as well. Now, not to get into too much detail, but it basically means the teeth on the chain ring go back and forth between a narrow and a wide profile, essentially meaning it grips onto the chain better and prevents chain drops. And that's what I found with this crank here, no, no chain drops at all. It also uses a SRAM dub standard for the axle. So that's a 28.99 millimeter diameter. And this Senex crank along with the two by variety that I've been using on my road bike for the last few months, actually. Yeah, they've both been, been flawless. So yeah, for the price and the overall fit and finish, yeah, these cranks are, yeah, they're great value, actually. 
right then, breaking with this conduct kit here. Um, yeah, it took a little bit of time because it was all new to me to kind of set it up and bleed the brakes and stuff. But now it's been on the bike and I've used it for a few miles. What is my verdict? Well, frankly, it's, yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> it's really, really good. When you're out on the bike using it, the brake feel is so close to fully hydraulic. It's, it's nearly indistinguishable. Now the hybrid hydraulic calipers that I've tested in the past, the kind of cable actuated ones, like the Zuintec F1s, which I thought were fantastic, by the way. The main drawback with those setups is that regardless of how good the cable housing is, because in my opinion, it's important to use a special compressionless cable housing, regardless of how good they are, they will always feel spongy when you put them up against a fully hydraulic setup. This is basically because cable stretch over the length of the of the brake run, it, it's inevitable, really. Especially with the rear brake, where the cable can be like one and a half meters long with those with those types of calipers. Yeah, they're going to stretch slightly, which leads to a, a spongy feel. Whereas with this conduct kit here, the brake cables are like what twenty centimeters long, so cable stretch is entirely negligible, which means the brake feel is really, really nice. Like nice and direct, you've got really good modulation. I mean, with this conduct kit, it's as close to fully hydraulic as you are ever gonna get using mechanical shifters. Now, a fully hydraulic brake setup is gonna be slightly better. You can more precisely adjust things like reach and, and free stroke adjustment, and you have a slightly finer level of control over, over brake modulation. But honestly, this conduct kit blew me away. It's far closer to a fully hydraulic brake feel than I ever thought possible with the, uh, yeah, mechanical shifters. But let me know, have you used this setup uh, in the past? I am absolutely loving it, but I know there are loads of you out there that detest this whole setup. So yeah, have you used Conduct before? If so, hit me up in the comments. Be really interested to know what your thoughts are. But yeah, overall, I am <laughs> super happy with the final result. I think it looks amazing and the ride quality is, yeah, it's great. I mean, out on the open road, it soaks up all of the rough tarmac and the potholes around here, no problem. And I can quite easily just kind of cruise uh, at 20 miles an hour. And then on the rough stuff, like gravel trails or wherever else I've, I've taken it so far, yeah, it's been, it's been faultless. Such, such good fun to ride this thing. Yeah, really enjoying using it so far. But what is the final uh, cost for this build, the final weight and how does it stack up to some kind of off the shelf options from some more of the bigger brands? Right then, the final cost for this build was 1,326 pounds 98p. Now for my UK folks, I've included import fees for everything apart from the frame and the group set. So they were sent to me for free. So it's difficult to know what duty I would have paid, but maybe slap an extra 50 quid on top for import duty. Now, weight wise, what are we looking at? Well, without the pedals and the bottle cages, as this is how the vast majority of bikes online will be weighed, 8.985 kilograms. So just under nine kilos, which is pretty good actually. Now, in terms of comparable bikes, I've tried to find some like for like options, but honestly, it was, it was quite difficult. There is so much choice on the market for gravel bikes, but hopefully this should give you a bit of a flavor. So first up, the Cannondale Topstone 2 gravel bike, alloy frame and a 10 speed Shimano GRX group set with fully hydraulic brakes, but weighing in at 10.3 kilos for 1,649 quid. So more expensive and over a kilogram heavier than my build. Orbea next, the Terra H40 gravel bike, alloy frame with a carbon fork, 10 speed Shimano GRX group set and fully hydraulic brakes, but 10.8 kilograms for 749 quid. So again, more expensive and heavier. BMC here, their unrestricted AL3 gravel bike, alloy frame, carbon fork, 10 speed uh, Shimano GRX group set and fully hydraulic brakes. But again, over 10 kilograms for 1,899 quid. So yeah, a bit of a pattern emerging here. And lastly, over to Canyon with their Grizzle CF SL6. So it's a carbon frame and other than the two by drivetrain, seems relatively similar to my setup. Um, 1,949 quid or nearly two and a half thousand dollars and 9.84 kilograms if you can wait because you can, you can see here some sizes you've got to wait for around six months to get one of these things. So essentially from the big name brands for an 11 speed gravel bike with hydraulic brakes at around nine kilograms, yeah, it's easily upwards of, of 2,000 pounds. Plus, many of these aren't quite as versatile as my build because most of them lack all, the, all of the mounting points. So yeah, this build looking pretty good value actually. Um, anyway, that aside, let's dive into the final thoughts and I'll tell you a couple of things 
I would probably change on this thing. So overall, as you may have guessed, I am incredibly happy with this thing. It all came together really nicely and the final result is a great mix of some more budget friendly options alongside some kind of slightly more premium name brand parts as well, if you ask me. Now the build uh, in its entirety was relatively simple actually, all things considered. And yeah, I think the final result is gonna be a dependable and robust bike, at least from what I've seen so far. Now, having said that, if I was to do this whole build again, there are one or two things actually that I, I would change. The first of which is the tires. I would actually, I would max them out basically. So this frame can handle up to 700 by 45 C tires. And I've gone for 700 by 40 C because I thought they'd be a good compromise. But if I was to do this again, I'd go straight for the maximum. So 700 by 45. I don't think it would really affect the road handling that much, but it would just give me that kind of little bit of extra squidge to play with on the rough stuff. Secondly, a 44 tooth chain ring up at the front is a little bit big in my opinion. Now, gravel bikes aren't built for kind of ultimate speed out on the roads. And as a result, I very rarely go into the smallest 11 tooth cog on the cassette. Plus having a kind of smaller 40 or 42 tooth ring on the front would give me a little bit of extra climbing ability as well, which definitely wouldn't hurt. Thirdly, the, uh, the pedal the pedal choice for this build. Um, yeah, these Costello pedals, which I, which I initially stuck on, these are not the right choice for this bike. Okay, so I'm out on the maiden, maiden voyage, and one, one thing has become clear very quickly, these are not the right pedals to, to use. Yeah, you just can't clip into them particularly easily, and getting out of them in a hurry, yeah, that does leave a lot to be desired. But other than that, this bike absolutely rips. Loving it. So for the time being, I've actually switched over to using these China play pedals on the bike. So they're double-sided, so make clipping in and out a hell of a lot easier. But ultimately, I need to go for an SPD or some other kind of mountain bike-esque pedal for this build. So if you've got any suggestions for me, definitely let me know in the comments. And lastly, although these fulcrum wheels have been fine, I guess, I really think this build could benefit from some slightly more premium wheels, maybe something a bit more lightweight with a slightly wider rim profile as well. I think I could probably run the tires at a slightly lower pressure. And on that note, I have some absolutely incredible looking wheels coming my way from, from Elite Wheels. They're in the post at the minute and I'll throw some pictures up. Yeah. They look absolutely incredible. Some of the coolest wheels I've ever seen and they're gravel specific as well. So as soon as I get them, I'll stick them on the bike and review for those coming up in the next few weeks. And yeah, get subscribed so you don't miss that one. Right then, ladies and gents, that's it. It's been a, <laughs> it's been a pretty monster episode today. Um, yeah, but I hope you lot out there, hope you enjoyed it, hope you got something from it. Um, anyway, I'll put links to loads of the jazz that I use for the build down there in the video description, so check that out at your leisure if you want. Um, and let me know, what, what do you think of the bike? What do you think of the build? Is there anything kind of you would change if you were to build this yourself? Would you go fully hydro on the brakes, for example? Yeah, let me know. Um, so yeah, subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this thing that I've meticulously crafted for you. Um, and if you've got any questions or any comments about any of the stuff that I've done today, any of the components, choices I've made, then yeah, leave me a comment and I'll try to get back to as many of you as I can. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go and have some tea, uh, tea now, cause it's, uh, well, that's wrong, that's an hour slow, it's five past eight, nearly 10 past eight. It's well into tea time and I'm gonna go and get something to eat. So I'll see you uh, in the next episode. Ciao, ciao. Hui, wa, wa. So I think I found myself a little, little piggy friend. Have a look. He's eyeing me up. Looks dangerous. Gotta keep my wits about me. <laughs>